You know, 30-some years ago, when I was growing up in the suburbs, northwest of Washington, D.C., in Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, we were blasting rock music. I mean, artists like the Eagles, Heart with Stevie Nicks, yes, I love Stevie Nicks, Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd, it was amazing. But teenagers today, like my 13-year-old granddaughter, are listening to artists like Drake, who's Afro-Jewish, and Asian rapper Honey Cocaine. <laughs> my things have changed, and they're both from Toronto. You know, in the 50s and 60s, and being a child of the 60s, the beat culture challenged us. It challenged the status quo, and it unified liberals. Yes, it did, and it prompted change. And much like that, the hip-hop culture has challenged the system, and it's unified us in ways that have inspired our youth. Hip-hop is very eclectic. It has a very eclectic audience, and I believe that it has the greatest opportunity to change the way that we live and to build bridges and to mend ethnic relations throughout our communities. Hip-hop can reach us not only on a local level, but on a global level as well. The raw beginnings of hip-hop and contemporary rap music started in the 70s, in the Bronx. Basically, what was happening is that the urban black youth were able to express themselves. They told stories. They were telling stories about crime. They told stories about drugs and violence. The urban youth had finally found a platform to express themselves. Now, while critics of rap music and the hip-hop culture, they were fixated on the negative images. They basically felt that it was focusing a lot on sex and crime and violence and harsh language. Well, they tried to censor this genre. They tried to censor hip-hop. Well, hip-hop became even more popular. And the reason hip-hop became popular was because of that very resistance. I mean, the more you say, don't do it, the more the youth are going to do exactly that. So what they did is they bought it. They bought it hook, sink, and barrel. Well, at that time, rap music was also being discovered by the music industry and the print and media. Thanks to the first rap concert tour that was produced by Michael Malden, the New York City Fresh Festival, rap music was brought to the main front. You had artists like Run DMC and Houdini and the Fat Boys. Rap music blossoms. And then in the 90s, rap music, the genre, took off completely. It was amazing. It was the fastest growing music in the country. Rap music at the time took up 10% of the music sales, which was like $12.3 billion of music sales. And that's a lot of music sales. Um, the charts, the pop charts in particular, rap music took over. In 1998, nine out of the 13 albums on the pop chart were rap. So hip-hop has transcended beyond music. Hip-hop is a lifestyle. It's a culture. I'm actually hip-hop. The hip-hop community has transcended ethnic boundaries, geographic and political boundaries. It has changed language and fashion and attitude. I mean, now you can actually hear a Chinese or a Filipino, and even some of you in this audience using slime. Like, dig it, it's dope, legit. All of that just to say something is excellent. It's interesting because I was in Japan in 2007 with Bow Wow on tour, and we were going through the streets, and this young Japanese teenager, he had his cap on, but not just any cap, he had on a Snoop Dogg cap. And he was walking through the streets. Now, mind you, he couldn't speak fluent English, but he was fluent in the slang of street hip-hop. And he was jamming the music. It's interesting because I often think about hip-hop and its attitude and its language. And it's so important because it builds bridges. I mean, for example, a kid from Detroit can communicate very easily with a kid from Hong Kong. And what's really amazing is in Beverly Hills, kids are now sensitive 
to what's going on in Compton because of the music. Hip hop fashion has crossed all boundaries. It's now a multi-billion dollar fashion industry. The hip hop has prompted various industries to embrace the appetite of the music. Why? Because over 75% of the audience is non-black. Although racism still exists in our society, it's not strong enough to thwart off the love for the hip-hop music and the hip-hop culture among our youth. I mean, it has gone from the fringes to the suburbs, and it's now in the corporate boardrooms. Coca-Cola, Nike, many, many corporate giants are capitalizing on this phenomenon called hip-hop. Hip-hop offers us a paradigm of what can be. Um, the potential of this art form is amazing because hip-hop can mend, as I said, it can mend relationships. Hip-hop can be used as a tool, as a development tool. Hip-hop is substantial. I think it's possible for the hip-hop culture to keep its rebellious spirit and its flavor and speak to the streets. I also think that hip-hop can say that we are community and we have love and respect for all. It's possible. It's also possible for rap artists like T.I. and Young Jock to represent the American youth in a positive way, the same way that Bob Marley, John Lennon did back in our day. Here's a little story that happened. Uh, back September 11, 2001, I think I was reading the Washington Post article, and they were basically talking about hip hop. Not nice. They were basically saying that hip hop was uncaring. Hip hop didn't have a conscience. And I was reading this and I was thinking, wow, this is really negative. Basically, you're saying hip hop has no humanity. So I'm thinking, September 11th, a lot happened on that day. That was the same day that Jay Z dropped one of the largest rap records, The Blueprint. It was huge. And he donated a large proceed of that album to the September 11th fund. Now, at the same time, Puffy, Sean Combs, to some of you, wrote a check for a million dollars. He personally wrote a check for a million dollars to the American Red Cross. But hip hop was still getting a bad rap. OK, I'm missing something, right? So, I remember calling Michael Malden, who was in LA at the time, and he was working on the, um, well, actually, he was attending a premiere for Hardball. And I was mad. And I'm calling him, like, I cannot believe this. I mean, this is crazy. Hip hop is doing a lot in the community, and we're getting a bad rap. And I'm reading this article. This is insane. So at that moment, I realized I had to do something. We had to do something. So we did. On October 11th in 2001, we had a rally, and it was on the west end of Atlanta. And we went into that community, and we said, we are going to raise awareness, and we're going to raise support. And we did that for the local American Red Cross, Salvation Army, and the September 11th Fund. So we raised awareness, and we raised money. But more importantly, I realized we had struck a chord within that community, and it felt good. And that was the moment when Hip Hop for Humanity came alive. Hip Hop for Humanity is a 501c3 nonprofit organization based here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, our organization is focusing on education and health initiatives for our youth. We address critical issues facing our communities, and we utilize our resources to make a difference in the areas of education, health, AIDS awareness, and prevention. Hip Hop for Humanity's mission evolved from the love of music and its community. Hip Hop for Humanity believes in partnering and collaborative efforts 
because we clearly cannot do this work by ourselves. So with that in mind, we realize that the need is great and the problems are even bigger. So if we all get along, work together, we can strengthen our communities on a local, national, and global level. So another disaster hit, Hurricane Katrina. Couldn't believe it. And that was a great opportunity, because at that moment, I decided, you know what? Hip Hop for Humanity, we're going to get on the road. And we're going to go on tour with the Scream Tour. I mean, why not? It's a great idea. It's traveling around. It'll be a great opportunity for us to get into the trenches and see exactly what's going on. So we did. Now, the Scream Tour was an, a tour, a concert tour for youth, and it was based here in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, Atlanta Worldwide Touring produced it, along with Atlantic Records. And they were all about the positiveness of hip-hop and all about the positiveness of our youth. So thinking this is a good move, I received a call from Craig Kalman, who is the CEO of Atlantic Records. And Craig is a visionary. And Craig said, you know what, Judy? I know your passion. I know what you're doing, but I want you to talk to somebody. And I'm thinking, okay, well, if he suggested it, I probably should do this. So he said, there's a young lady in Detroit I want you to talk to. And I said, okay. So I called her. And I spoke to this young lady. And I was blown away because she was telling me things I couldn't believe it. And I was like, oh my God. She's got that same passion and drive and spirit, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I believe I have found a fellow foot soldier. So off we go. Well, you know what? This soldier is very, very special. Her name is Taja, and Taja wanted to eradicate hunger in the cities. So she started an organization, Urban Farming, in Detroit. And I'm thinking, okay urban farming in Detroit. Okay, great. Well, even further, Taja is a gifted artist. Taja was signed by Prince, and we all know Prince doesn't sign very many artists. So Taja decided, you know what? She's going to put that music career on hold because she felt she had a bigger calling. And here's a little bit about what she's doing. Hi, I'm Taja Savelle, and uh, we're here today, we're in, we're in Harlem. We're planting food, we're getting rid of hunger, and that's our goal. What we're doing is, you know, we plant food on unused land, and we give it to hungry people. And uh, so our goal is to eradicate hunger. We want to be the first generation that just got rid of hunger, for once and for all. During World War II, they planted victory gardens. 20 million Americans planted victory gardens in this country. and. Uh, they grew 40% of the nation's produce supply. So when people say, you know, it can't be done, it's already been done. I just want to say how, you know, how honored I am that, you know, to even be considered by, you know, by urban farming and anything that I could do to help from here on out. You know, you guys just contact us and let us know in Atlanta or Detroit or Miami or California, you know, wherever. Japan, we go wherever with it, you know what I'm saying? Wanna come see? The peppermint is like totally all the way over there. Like, come on, let's go. Let's We're gonna go. Actually, actually show you where it's at. It's so cool. It actually yeah. smells like the real thing. First, we had to do was we came over here and we got like this big, these big buckets of black stuff and like pulled it. No, it was they called it something else. We have a community garden that's five blocks long in the North Bronx, and we, uh, we're here to support urban farming. It's pretty much like a great diversity piece when we have like the Spanish, blacks, whites, Asian, and they're all coming together and they're planting in the garden. Uh, and 10% of the food will be donated to homeless shelters and food banks and uh, any families that need it around the surrounding communities. And all the food that you're all planting here today is when it's harvested, it's going to be given to the Westside Food Bank. We're in several cities across the uh, country, and we're really happy that you could be part of this to eat healthy and eradicate hunger here in Los Angeles.
It's an awesome opportunity for us because it's another project that we could work on and stuff. It sends out a good message. And when this thing, you know, literally from a seedling grew into something like this, and all of you, to be out here like this is such a, a beautiful act of love. I mean, you can't have a, a better goal than this than urban farming. And for me to have just to be a small little part of this is joyous for me. I feel I was able to mobilize um, all of Atlantic Records, the Atlantic staff, and so many of the executives because the purity of the spirit of this mission was so clear. They come out their homes, those that will, and just ride and look, and we talk more. We're starting to communicate. Good. We're starting to communicate. Good. That's, really good. That's the number one thing. Hello, I'm Taja Savelle, and I'm a recording artist. I received my first record deal with Prince, but when I was recording uh, my third CD for Sony Records in Detroit, Michigan, I started to see all of this unused land in the city, and it was very disturbing to me. Uh, I saw blocks and blocks of unused land and severe poverty. So in 2005, with $5,000 and a pamphlet, I started Urban Farming and Three Gardens. Urban Farming is a global nonprofit organization, and what we do is we encourage people and we empower people to plant and grow their own food. And the people that we reach are unemployed, underemployed, laid off, malnourished, have unhealthy diets, or are suffering from hunger or food insecurity. In 2006, we became the adopted charity of Atlantic Records, really started to help our growth. Uh, we garnered the support of T.I. and Young Jock and Prince and, and uh, Umar from The Last Poets, Richard Lewis, Kiki Palmer, so many wonderful people that really helped to get the word out about urban farming. And so now we have over 57,000 community and residential gardens around the world that are a part of the urban farming global food chain. We have fed over one million people with the urban farming community gardens, which we like to call food empowerment zones. And the reason that we call them food empowerment zones is because they give the fish and the fishing pole. They give people emergency food relief, but they also teach people how to grow their own food, which is really, really important. Urban farming also has a coexistence model. And we address business growth, job creation, health and wellness, urban redevelopment, urban agriculture, and global investment. We recognize that those are key elements that are needed to create a viable and economically sustainable community. We also raise awareness about healthy thinking, healthy eating, healthy fitness, healthy families, and healthy finances. And we have poetry and music and dance at the garden, and that's where we can tell our stories and raise awareness about green collar jobs and emerging green businesses. Urban farming also, in 2008, began to create these edible walls. We had a problem because not every city has all of the unused land that Detroit has. So New York, Los Angeles, a little bit of a different picture. So we started installing edible walls, literally a garden on the wall, very cool. The other thing about these edible walls is that they provide green collar jobs. They cut down on up to 60% of the heating and cooling costs of the host building. They cut down on the rainwater runoff in a city, the urban heat index in a city, and they feed people and they look beautiful. So we love the addition of the urban farming edible walls. This year on Earth Day, we are announcing the Urban Farming 100 Million Families and Friends campaign. We're very excited about this campaign. We're reaching out to 100 million families and friends around the world and asking them to register their garden at urbanfarming.org. Now, a person could have a planted pot on their kitchen counter, or they could have a farm. They may have a garden in their yard, they may have a garden at their school, a corporate garden, a wall garden, rooftop garden, doesn't matter. Big or small, register them all at urbanfarming.org. I was hoping I could get that in, that little. <laughs> anyway, when you register your garden with Urban Farming, 
you also sow the seeds of change into our future. We recognize that our world is communicating laterally, and we're more aware of events going on around the world than ever before because of social media and all the tweeting and wonderful things that everybody's doing today also to get the word out about these wonderful projects. So we want to make sure that that people realize that we're all creating a paradigm shift. We are all the architects of our future. And when you register your garden with urbanfarming.org, you're sowing the seeds of change, you become an architect of our future, and you become a part of the urban farming global food chain. Thank you. And thank you so much to Judy Malden for bringing the world of music into the seeds of change and for your extraordinary vision with Hip Hop for Humanity. I love this woman. <laughs> thank you, love. Can I help you down? That's pretty amazing. Believe it or not, I actually have a farm. It's a pretty big farm. I thought I knew farming until I met Taja, <laughs> clearly. Um, like Taja, there are many, many other foot soldiers. Um, Alicia Keys is another. Um, Alicia is a modern day Renaissance woman, and I absolutely adore her. She's a powerful force in the global AIDS and HIV um, fight. In 2003, Alicia Keys, along with Lee Blake, who was a TV film producer and also an AIDS activist, founded Keep a Child Alive. And Keep a Child Alive is an amazing organization. Thanks to Alicia's tireless efforts, they have raised millions of dollars for the care of HIV to families in Africa and India. And in addition to Alicia, there are many other organizations that Hip Hop for Humanity supports. Um, Common has an after-school program in Chicago where he uses music and his time to help students. In addition, right here in Atlanta, Hip Hop for Humanity supports the Ron Clark Academy, which uses music to help our children in education. Uh, we also represent and, let me not say represent, but we also support Usher's New Look Foundation here in Atlanta, the Ludacris Foundation, and Scream Star Entertainment, the next generation of leaders. Hip Hop is a development tool, and it can transform education. Uh, Hip Hop for Humanity seeks to decrease the high school dropout rate. We believe that by having music programs in the schools, that this will keep children in school, but then it will also encourage them to go on to post the secondary education. Hip Hop for Humanity recognizes that the kids, once they're exposed to these programs, and they use music that they will stay in school, as I said, and they will also go on to be better global citizens. With this in mind, in 2005, Hip Hop for Humanity introduced a music program called the Business of Entertainment on the campus of Emory University. Now, this particular program was in association with Georgia State University School of Social Work, their MSW program, and Communities in Schools. This was an amazing, amazing project because in as much as it was a pilot program, students were selected across the state of Georgia and they were exposed to various different careers in the music and entertainment industry. They were also able to release themselves <laughs> um, in the music skills as well, but it was basically focusing on the business of entertainment. Students participated in skill building workshops led by entertainment industry professionals, community leaders, and in addition, the business of entertainment was about fostering self-esteem and confidence in our kids. Hip Hop for Humanity students were able to use music to enhance their skills in team building and also in interpersonal skills. Students were encouraged to use what they learned and to take back and apply in the classrooms as well as in their communities. Now today, in 2012, the Business of Entertainment is part of the UN Compendium of Worldwide Projects, Music as a Global Resource. It involves the UN, the UN Habitat, and the International Council for Caring Communities. Over the centuries, music has been a powerful global resource. Today, 
Music also offers solutions to many of the critical social and economic problems facing both developed and developing countries. The Music as a Global Resource Initiative has just published its third compendium, presenting over 100 projects from over 40 countries throughout the world, thereby enabling all nations to benefit from each other's experiences. The projects show the beneficial effect of music on sustainable community development, mental and physical health, working with trauma survivors, enhancing lifelong learning, and peace building. Vast opportunities exist for music, together with information and communication technologies, to provide solutions to our social and economic challenges. Music as a global resource unites the creative energy and expertise of the private sector with the political will of government to dramatically expand the use of music, thereby enhancing the lives of people everywhere. Dr. Matthew Lee, a pioneer in the belief that music can change lives, said clearly, Music is a universal, innate language with no natural boundaries. Its very accessibility is a vital argument for its widespread usage. It's pretty fascinating to think that Hip Hop for Humanity is now part of a UN compendium project that is part of the United Nations. A hundred programs, over a hundred different projects from 50 countries. And what's interesting is that most of those, and even half of those projects, are similar to some of the programs that we're using in the entertainment of business and business entertainment. Um, hip hop is the musical preference of young people throughout the country and in the world. And hip hop can make a major contribution to successfully address the many problems that are facing our young people. Hip hop is your community. Hip hop can unite communities. Hip-hop is a tool for youth development. It can be used to end hunger and starvation in our backyards. We saw what Taja was doing, as well as across the world. Hip-hop is a natural resource, and therefore, hip-hop is a global resource. So on behalf of Hip-Hop for Humanity and Music as a Global Initiative, I would like to encourage everyone, the hip-hop community, the business community, everyone here to join us. We would like to develop and expand more sustainable projects for our youth and enhance their future throughout the world. Thank you so much.